Well done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? It's good to see you this morning on Resurrection Day. What a great celebration day as we come to the Lord. And one of the things I love about Easter is that it's not too commercialized like Christmas. Amen. Sometimes uh, the world just wants to get involved in everything. And they have tried with their bunnies and their eggs and everything else. But hey, Jesus is Lord and risen from the dead. Uh, Y'all have to wake up now. Don't make me come down there again. So we talk about Easter and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that pivotal moment in history. You know, there's two great events uh, of these last days uh, that start, obviously, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As God just overcomes every physical law that there possibly is and raises Jesus from the dead and takes him off the planet, ultimately, to that time when he comes back. That other great event in time, and we're kind of living nestled in between those two marks of time. And what a great time it is to be alive, because I do believe that we're very close to that end part where Jesus Christ is going to come back again, and people are going to believe and see with their own eyes this risen Lord and Savior. Amen? The Bible says, more blessed are those who uh, haven't seen and yet have believed. Now, I hope that that's you today. I hope that you're one of those people who, who has believed, you have trusted. You put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You know, what a tragedy for Jesus Christ to have done everything that he did, uh, underwent everything that he underwent, experienced everything that, uh, that he experienced, and then for you not to ex- enjoy the result, the fruit of that resurrection life, and that of knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, knowing that every sin, every transgression, every wrongdoing, every wrong word you ever said has been erased and forgiven by the grace of God. What a great and mighty God we serve. He's done all this for us by sending his son Jesus to die in such a fashion that he did. And then raising him up from the dead as a testimony. Amen. But in, in thinking about all this great resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And realize that so many people, you know, don't have a, a lot of assurance in their life. And I, I want to talk to you about that. The surety that we can have because of what Jesus Christ has done. And the, the resurrection of Jesus, how important it is to what we believe and what God does in our life and what results in our life. You know, I, I'm looking back over the last 25 years of messages that I preached at Believer's Fellowship on Easter Sundays. And uh, just going through and seeing how many times, about, for about six or seven years in a row, it looks like, I'll preach on the resurrection specifically. And we've taken that from about every angle that you can imagine in these 25 years. And then about once every seven or eight years, I'll kind of do something a little different in regard to that message and the resurrection message about the effects of our life. And what I want to talk to you about today is, uh, is that because Jesus is risen, uh, the difference it can make in your life. But the tragedy is that so many people are, you know, they don't have that, that security. They, they don't have an assurance. They, they just don't have a peace in their heart that, let me ask you, you don't have to answer it out loud, but... How about you? How about if death knocked on your door today? How about if, if something just happened and it can happen at any time we know life is, is fragile, that where our life is, physical life just ends, you know, for whatever reason, whether, you know, I run over you in traffic or you just drop dead or whatever it might be. You just, it all ends. In this moment, you drew before this service was over you, your last breath, where would you spend eternity? Now, you probably, like I have talked to a lot of people, said, you know, I, well, I hope. I'd go to heaven. Well, I'm sure the devil wishes that. (laughs) But he's not going to heaven, all right? I hope, I'd like, here's another, I would like to think. Well, wouldn't we all like to think? And so, but you know, the Bible, you know, even John wrote in 1 John 4, says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. In other words, God says, you know, there doesn't have to be doubts that you really can be sure. And I really do believe that that the surety that we have We experience because he's risen. He's no longer dead. He's no longer in the grave. He's risen with great authority and power and has within that great authority and power of his. In fact, the Bible says God raised him from the dead and has given him a name above all names that Jesus is Lord. Because of the lordship of Christ, because of who he is, the authority he has, he can transform and change our lives. And the resurrection is so key and so pivotal that, in fact, we really can't even go to heaven if we don't believe in the resurrection. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. In fact, if you, if you study Scripture, it becomes very clear the importance of the resurrection. But out of that also is, is, a, is, is a, 
uh, a settling kind of feeling to know that because of the resurrection, Jesus can change lives. He does have the power to do that, and he has changed my life, hopefully changed your life, and that we can be sure. Here's what the scripture has to say. It says in, in Romans chapter 10, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That's the word of faith which we are preaching. This is the gospel message that you can, you can, know, you can know God. And here it is. If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now you might want to underline that. God has raised him from the dead. You have to believe that in your heart. You shall be saved. For with the heart a man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. So here we go. I believe in my heart that God's raised Jesus from the dead. And because I have this belief in my heart, I will confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. My life, all right? That's its ownership here. Not just saying the words. All right. There's a firm conviction. It doesn't say just believe in my mind. Heart means it's a it's a firm belief that you're you're going to embrace this thing. You believe in your heart. God raised you from the dead. You shall be saved. For with a heart a man believes unto righteousness. That you become made right with God because of this faith that you have now in Christ. You're putting your hope. Uh, I, I'd like to think so. I'm saying, well, I know so because of what the Bible says. So I put my trust in the right person, the right place, the right time, the right way. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that. I mean, when I talk to them, well, I'd like to think so. I hope so. I don't know. Maybe, well, you know, I was baptized or I joined the church or, you know, my dad was a preacher. And well, bless your heart, you know. But those, those are not the things the Bible says that give us an affirmation and a confirmation. There was a time in my life as a young man uh, where I would look at the ceiling and wonder what about what if I did die tonight? Maybe you've never had those thoughts. I think they're, they're healthy thoughts to have because the greatest question that anybody can address us with is this, this question about our eternity. Uh, praise God for the people who have boldness around us that would ask us, hey, do you know Christ? Do you know where you would go if you, if you died tonight? Where would you spend eternity? Because just as much as we live this physical life, we have a spiritual life. We're spiritual beings. Physical life will end, but our spirit being will go on into eternity somewhere. And so we need to know where, and then, then we need to have an assurance about, you know, uh, of where that's going to be. So what I've done, I've kind of penciled out some things here this morning, about five, six things that, that, uh, that cause these doubts in our heart, where we just kind of have these lingering kind of thing. Well, I hope I, I know. And, 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 you know, I really believe that we could probably split the room into two categories today. We'd have those people who know that they know that they really know, they know, they know, they know, that they know, that they know they know, you know what I mean, <laughs> are believers. All right? And then there's a, the other group of people, they're, they're, there may be some believers in it, but they're just not, they have no assurance. They, they just, they're not confident in it. They're, I mean, when they don't really pray with assurance, they have trouble in standing up because of that lack of assurance in their own life and telling anybody about Jesus or confessing Christ to other people. There's just, there's, there's no peace. And then within that same second group is also people who know they don't know. They know, they know they don't know, all right? They know they've never made that kind of commitment to Christ. They don't have a lot of religious uh, garments kind of or, uh, in their, their history of baptize or you know, going to church or having religious upbringing. Or that, and, and they just know they've never really come to that real place of assurance. And so there's kind of a couple of groups within that second group. Where would, where would you fall in that today? Where would you, you know, where does your life come in, in those kind of things? Well, if you find yourself in group number two, I'm so glad you're here today. Because I've got some good news for you. And that if, if, you, if you'll just listen a little bit and then embrace it and receive it, what God can do in your life will be phenomenal, be, uh, be life transforming. So let's break it down. Why do people have these lingering doubts and this lack of security and this lack of assurance? Well, uh, wh why am I doubting? Well, number one, I'm glad you asked, all right? It has to do with confusion. There's a lot of people that are, that are just confused. They, they're not, they just don't know the facts to start with. And you really can't have a, a, a foundation to stand on unless you have your facts right. And the facts are found in the Bible. This is God's word to us. It's, it's the gospel message. And God lays out some facts here. And if, if I'm confused about those things, and certainly I'm going to be confused and, and, and not sure. In fact, I found some people who think they're over here in group number one. They know that they know they know, but they're, they're not based on proper facts. They're, they're confused. 
They, they based them on things like, well, I go to church, I prayed to prayer, you know, I was, I was confirmed in a church service, I, I went through a religious order, or, you know, I'm a, I'm a member of the Masonic Lodge, or, and because they're a member of something, they think that that qualifies them. And that, that boils down to one word, that's religion. All right, we, everybody can get a little religion, you know. It's the most dangerous thing in the world, religion. But Christianity is completely the opposite of these religions. Christianity has to do with uh, uh, a personal, internal relationship in your, the spiritual aspect of you that has a relationship with God who is a spirit, and you know God. There's, there's this established relationship. But a lot of people have confusion about that, and they're just not sure. And so, so let me give you, you know, something here that I think that will help you. In Galatians 2, it puts it like this. Paul the Apostle says, I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. Because if righteousness comes by the law, and Christ died in vain. Now, what does that mean? Simply, it's like this. Jesus would be out of his mind. He had to be completely foolish to come and experience the death, the crucifixion, the way he died, and, it, and, and, and there'd be some other way for you to be saved. Why would he do that if there was some other way, if I could just be good enough, if I could just be, you know, holy enough, if I could just go to church enough, if I could just be a good person and not rob banks and not kill people, you know, all the things that people say. If that's good enough, then why would Jesus die? Well, he died because that isn't good enough. The law was given to show us how much we are sinners. And God says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. It just shows we do those things and that we're not right with God. And it shows us also what God's like. God's not a liar, he's not a thief, he's not an adulterer, God's holy, all right? So God, God shows us what he's like and he shows us what we're like in the law. So the law didn't come to, you know, for us to have some kind of 10 steps to salvation. The law comes to show us we can't save ourselves because we're sinners. So Paul says, you're going to just frustrate God's grace here because grace is all about God taking your place, paying the price himself for the son, giving up himself for you on the cross and then coming back from the dead. All right, God, God paid the price. So don't frustrate the grace of God. You're not going to be saved because you did X number of things. There's no formula that works like that. In fact, 2, 8, and 9 of Ephesians, Paul wrote again, it's not of works lest any man should boast. In other words, there's no amount of good activities, no amount of sermons I can preach, mission trips I can take, money I can give. None of that's going to equal righteousness. By the way, that's what God is. He's righteous and I need to be righteous. And the only way I can be righteous is for him to make me righteous. And that happens when I come to Christ through the blood of Jesus, forgiving me and cleansing me of my sins. So don't miss this here because there's a lot of people who are confused about this. So you re-clarify in your mind, you know, this issue of security of no, is based upon the fact that I have this assurance that Jesus is the Lord of my life. The, 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 the second thing that, that's on this particular list of why people doubt it would have to do with this. They're, they have second thoughts about earlier decisions or maybe childhood decisions at some point in their life. Perhaps they were around the gospel, might have been a camp, youth camp somewhere, vacation Bible school, all the places where children especially would like, would hear the gospel, you know, or maybe, in, in, maybe it was just a little moment of desperation in your life and, and, and you, you know, you made a decision in your heart and your mind and you, you, you kind of left wondering, was that real or was that genuine? You know, how, how do I... I mean, how, how do I know that that, that was the real thing and I, I'm just not going through some religious motions or emotions? How, how can I clarify that? Well, as I talked about, there are facts from the Word of God that we need to understand and we need to believe. And I think, if I, I'm give you just a few little sub-points here that'll help you if you're maybe in this category saying, you know, I made a decision, but I just, Pastor, I, you know, if I got real honest with you today, I'm just not sure that it, that it, that it was real. There's a couple of things that will help you out. One is, I do believe there's some revelations or uh, uh, illuminations or understandings that we have to have before we're ever going to come to know Christ. One is this. I have to be aware of the fact that I, I need a Savior, that I'm, that I'm a sinner, right? The Bible says all sin comes short of the glory of God. Hey, if I'm not willing to embrace that, I'm not going to walk with God. I'm not going to know God. If I, if I think I'm good enough to be with God and be what God wants me to be without me realizing who I am, then I'm in, I'm in trouble. Uh, someone said it like this. You, you'll never be found until you realize you're lost. You know, how many of you, when you were a kid, you went to a big store somewhere, you were with your parents, and you went off as a child and headed for some, probably the toy department, you know, in the big store? You know, and you went back there and you're playing with the toys and all of a sudden you realize some time has passed and your mom's off shopping somewhere in Walmart or whatever, big superstore, and, and, and you start looking for her. And then, you know, I remember this experience as a little kid. We, we had a Kmart, you know, big, in the big town near us, and we'd drive at least once a month, maybe twice a month to the Kmart. 
And I love going to the Kmart. You know, some of y'all remember what those were, right? And there's still a couple around. Uh, and I, we, we, I'd go back there and play with the toys for a while. But when I got through bored playing with the toys, which doesn't take me a long time to get bored, you know. I was one of those AD, ADHD, whatever. That's what they'd call me. But my teachers called me an OLP. That's obnoxious little punk. But... <laughs> I get a little desperate and want to know, you know, where Mama was. And so I start walking down the stores and looking down the aisle, Mama, Mama, Mother. You know, and I wouldn't find her and I'd get a little louder, Mama. And I'd walk down the aisle, still wouldn't find her and go look. And by the time, I'm sure what I was crying when she was turning the other one, you know, <laughs> those deals. And, 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 to the point I get, Mama! To get to, Mama! <laughs> Mom! <laughs> I didn't want to be left at Kmart no matter how many toys they had, all right? And sometimes I think she'd just let me do that so I'd realize that I need to get my game in order. But it's the same way in your relationship to your heavenly parent, your heavenly father. If you don't realize you're apart from him, you'll probably never come to him. There has to be some point in your life, and I do believe children can experience this, okay? I, I, but I do believe that there needs to be a reaffirmation that in your, your later in your life, you go back and look at this thing and say, hey, what, did I realize I was lost and needed a Savior? Obviously, uh, and, and, and needing that Savior, I realized that Jesus is the one who paid the price for my sins. You, know, you can't exclude this whole issue of, the, of the, 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 the crucifixion of Jesus from your salvation. He died so you could be saved. And so I realize that I'm, I'm without God, then I realize I need God, and I realize that Jesus is the way to get to God. And then as I do that, then I, 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 there's a choice that's made. And again, you know, it's not probably as radical for, an, for a young child as it is for an adult, as far as our understanding is, but it's still radical. We're turning not from just what we do, and, and please understand this, we, this works because a lot of people miss it. We turn from what we are. Because when you first come to Christ, he's dealing with you what you are. You say, well, what are I? You're a sinner. All right. You do what you do because you are what you are. Why do pigs oink instead of bark? They're pigs. You guys are getting smarter every day. You keep coming here, you're going to be geniuses, all right? <laughs> pigs oink, dogs bark, cats me. Yeah, that's, they do what they do because they are what they are. We do what we do because we are what we are. Until I realize what I are, I'm not ever going to be changed. And so when I realize what I am and I realize who Jesus is, he's the Savior, then in this moment in my heart, I, there's this, this point of, the Bible used this good word called repent, all right? Jesus said, except you repent, you'll perish. It's a change of mind. It produces a change of heart where no longer, you know, uh, uh, do I want to stay where I was? I, I don't want to be what I was. I, I, I want to be different. I, I don't want to live the way I'd lived before. I, I, I want to know God. I want to be in his family. So there's this point, and this is really kind of two sides of the same coin, repentance and faith, all right? I trust. I trust Jesus to save me. I'm not trusting my works. I'm not trusting my church attendance. I'm not trusting not robbing banks and not killing people. That that's going to get me. I, I, Jesus is my Savior. For if we believe with the heart that God raised from the dead, all right? There's this point. I, real, I believe in the resurrection power of Jesus. He died for my sins. God raised from the dead. And I embrace that. So there's this point of, of awareness. So how, maybe, that's, maybe that's you today. Maybe you fall in that particular area where you're, you're struggling over this. And I would hope today that you could kind of revisit that time in your life. And if you're looking at it and say, well, I was with it, then, then you say, praise God and thank God for saving me that time. Maybe you look at it and say, no, I just felt bad for my sins. I didn't want to go to hell. You know, that guy was preaching fire and brimstone. I didn't. He'd probably be setting one of my earlier revivals, you know. You know, you, you, you felt the heat around your neck. And you say, I don't want to do that. But yet you didn't realize that how much God loves you. You didn't realize the crucifixion of Jesus for your sins. You didn't realize you need to turn your heart to him in faith. You just didn't want to go to hell, you know. We just, it was kind of like we got caught with our hand in the cookie jar. And we're really sorry. We're sorry because we got caught. You know what I mean? So revisit in your own heart and mind because, you know, if, it's, if it wasn't genuine, then it can be. You can trust the Lord and get it straight. Another reason, and this is where especially a lot of believers have a problem about this issue of an unforgiving spirit. The Bible says if you forgive men their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, how are you going to experience the forgiveness of God? In other words, everything about God speaks of forgiveness, does it not? 
God wants to forgive you. God wants to heal your heart and life. God wants to change you. He desires to forgive you. And when you come to him, guess what? You can experience the forgiving hand of God. You can experience the forgiving grace of God. And, and, and it's, it's a glorious moment to experience that, that in your life. But God says, now, if you turn around and you're not willing to forgive other people who've offended you, how are you going to experience forgiveness? I think sometimes we fail to see just how we have offended God. Now, some of you, maybe you have a higher estimation of yourself than you really ought, and you don't think you've offended God. But when we sin and choose to do our own will and to do our own thing, we're basically saying, God, you don't have a right to be God. I am my own God. Well, that's the bottom line of it. That's the, that's the bottom line of Satan's sin in heaven. Now, I want to sin to the top. I'm going to make myself like God. And when we refuse God's right to be God over our lives, that's the ultimate sin of unbelief, you know? And so what we have to come to is not only say, say Lord, I accept your forgiveness and you're in charge of my life, but now when people offend me, just like when I offended God, he forgave me. When they offend me, what's God telling me to do? Forgive them. Now we stop right here. We say, hey, yeah, but hold on because you don't know what they did. You don't understand how deeply it hurt. We don't understand what we did when Jesus died on the cross. We don't understand the agony and the suffering, not much less the nails and the pain, the, the beatings, the crown of thorns, the, hor the horrific crucifixion he experienced. That was a tremendous offense, but that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was when the Apostle Paul put it like this. He who knew no sin, never done anything wrong, he became our sin on the cross. He took every wrong of mine, all my offenses, and then he forgave me. You talk about the highest or the lowest of depths to go, and offenses poured upon him. Certainly Jesus did, but he turned, in turns, comes back and chooses to forgive us when we come to him humbly. We need to embrace the same attitude of forgiving people. The Bible says even while we were yet in our trespasses, while we were still sinning, that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. He didn't wait till we got better. He didn't wait till we, we apologized and, and, and sorry, sorry I offended you, God. He just came and did it anyway. That's the action we have to take because if we don't, then we're not going to experience the freedom that God has for us in our life. Let me tell you, every one of us is going to be offended. You might be offended before you get out of the building today. I don't know. Some folks are a little touchier than other people, but the idea is offenses are going to come and when they come, your response is to forgive. And if you don't forgive, how are you going to experience the real freedom of Jesus in your life? But let me turn that another little bit different way now as we talk about having an unforgiving spirit and realize sometimes we are the offenders and we need to reconcile with other people when we've offended them. We need to be the one who reaches out in restoration. The Bible says in Matthew 5, if you bring your gifts to the altar, in other words, you're coming to worship God, and you remember there while you're at the altar that you have somebody, a brother, sister, who has ought against you. I mean, they're, they're offended. that You've offended them on some level, maybe not even intentionally. I can do that myself sometimes, amen. Don't intend to, but I did. You didn't mean to hurt them. You didn't mean to. It, that's not what you meant when, when something was said. It was, they just completely took it wrong. But even with that, sometimes it's a willful offense. You know, well, that's the way you're going to treat me. I'm going to treat you like this. Or who do you think you are? Whatever it might be. He says, if you, don't bring, if you want to get right with God, then you go get right with them and then bring your gift to the altar and God receive it. In other words, God has called us to be reconcilers and restorers. And there's going to be, there's going to be times in your life and my life when we do the wrong thing. We say the wrong thing. We hurt somebody. Sometimes we do it flat intentionally. God says, you go get that right. How am I going to experience the freedom of God. God stepped out in time and eternity and reached out his hand to reconcile and restore me. We need to have the same kind of attitude and the same kind of humility and the same kind of compassion. Because if we don't, all kinds of barriers become up in our life and we'll begin to have all kinds of doubts because we're not going to experience the grace of God, the peace of God. We're not going to experience the joy of, of relationship with him that God wants us to experience. We're going to have difficulty even in our prayer life. And I really believe we'll have difficulty in even sharing our faith with other people when this lack of assurance is, is in our heart and life. But that's just a, a, a few. There's, there's another thing that seems to cause doubts in, in people's life. And sometimes, especially in regard to believers, it's a particular sin that you're not willing to yield to the Lord. When there's things in your life and, and you're not willing to yield those things to the Lord, and you're holding on to different things when God speaks to you, it's going to create all kinds of uh, darkness. The Bible says for the child of God that we're to walk in the light. What does that mean? That means as God directs my life, I'll respond to him. 
How many times have you been walking through life and maybe you did something, said something, you knew it wasn't right, or you acted in a certain way, and the Holy Spirit who lives in you, if you're a Christian, spoke to your heart about, That's, you need to get that right. But we didn't want to get it right, so we just ignored it. It's kind of like what I said a while ago, when we first come to Christ, we come and give to him who we are. We are sinners, you know? It's kind of like, say this book is not the Bible, let's say this book is my life, all right? And, and I come to God when I realize I'm lost without God, and I put my, my, my life in his hands, my book. And I say, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. You know what God does in that broken moment of my life? He says, I forgive you and I cleanse you. And then he comes into my life. And now, as my life starts from this moment on, it's like turning pages, day one with Jesus. You know what God said to me on day one with Jesus? Why are you still smoking? I thought that was a dumb question. Because I like smoking. I not only like smoking, I love smoking. And, you know, but I, and then the Lord reminded me what happened over here on the front cover over here. He says, you know, and, and it's just in my heart, me and the Lord talking. He says, remember last night when you prayed, God, anything you want in my life, my life is yours. Yes, Lord. And you prayed, you didn't want to play church. Yes, Lord, I really want to be real. He said, let me lay that down. It's going to hinder your testimony. It's probably going to kill you too, so lay that down. Not going to lay it down. I had a lot of trouble with it. It was a struggle, but it was laid down before the Lord. And we get on to other days in my life, and we keep turning pages, and the Lord's just going through, and he starts dealing with it. Why is God doing this? Because God is holy. And God is righteous, and he wants to have a deeper, intimate relationship with me. And there are things in my life, just like when you raise your children, you, know, you see the faults and the failures in your children's hearts and lives that are going to hinder their relationship with you, with your family, whatever it might be, to their future, to their relationship with other people. You want, you want to deal with those things and teach them and instruct them and discipline them you know, and raise them in the right way. God's doing the same. He's a heavenly father, and he's dealing with these issues that hinder my walk, my relationship, my prayer life, my fruitfulness, my fullness, my joy, my peace. And so he, he just deals with those things. And so if he comes to a page here and say, we're down, down the road in my life now, and he says, all right, Joe, I want, I, I, here's something here. It's, it's, it's in your life. And you've probably been blind to it because we all have our blind spots, right? But I want you to start dealing with this. And I tell the Lord, no. Or I say, okay, Lord, I said I was doing it wrong. And I come to the altar. Oh, fuck, you said, man, I just said it. We all have those snot and tear moments, don't we? But then I get up and go and do anything about it. I just go back out to what I was doing. You realize now I've got this issue in my life that's hindering me and now I've grieved the Spirit of God and I've, I've quenched the Spirit of God like the Scriptures tells us not to do. And, and the Holy Spirit which lives in me, which has been given to me as this precious gift of God to, to strengthen and, and empower and fill my life the way He wants to. I, I'm hindering what He wants to do in my life now because I won't let go. All kinds of stuff we can get a hold of, and it always leads to doubts, lack of assurance, fears. And it opens the door for all kinds of other problems in our life, you know, because sin, kind of like cancer, just wants more and more and more. So I have to come to this place where it's just all. It started back when I gave my life to, my life to Jesus. There it is. But now God starts dealing with me. And I know some people think that salvation is a little different than that. Salvation is saying, uh, you know, I, well, okay, God, I, I know I'm a sinner, but... Thank you for saving me. I'll accept you as my Savior. You'll save me, deliver me from hell. But you're, I don't want you to tell me what to do. Remember that verse we read a while ago? I'll read it again in a moment. It says, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord. It doesn't say Savior. In fact, Jesus could not be Savior if he were not Lord. Lord is who he is. Savior is what he does. And a lot of people want what he does, but they don't want who he is. Okay, you got my drift on that? Say, uh-huh. You know, we, we, want, we, we want heaven. Yeah, I listen to that old song, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to pray. Kind of thing, you know. Nobody wants to give their heart and their life really over to the Lord. We, we, you know, I, I'll give you a chapter, but you can't have the book. <laughs> you can have a chapter of my life. You can have a problem, and you know, take my wife, you know. <laughs> it's my kids, fix them, you know. Fix this in my life, and I'm not really interested in giving you my life. Then you're going to fail miserably at this point because you're not going to know the grace and the glory and the blessing and the beauty of giving your life to Jesus. Coming to Christ is not like Sears' easy payment plan. It's not 10% down and 10% every time you get under conviction. You still with me? Some of you left the room on that one. It's, I'll give you my life. 
And then at this point now, I begin to, get, to, to yield. But it, what if happens if I don't start yielding? Then doubts come and frustrations come and fears come and all kinds of problems come. There's one last one I want to share with you. It's this point of pride in becoming a Christian. And I've seen this happen to too many people. You know, they want to be saved, but they don't want to confess like the scripture says that Jesus is Lord. Matthew puts it this way. Who therefore shall uh, confess me before men? Him I confess before my Father which is in heaven. That's good. But what about those who don't confess me? If you deny me, if you want, if you want confess me, which means deny me, you say, well, I'm not denying him. You're not confessing him. It's the same thing. If you won't confess me before men, I'm, <laughs> I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. Which ties us back to this, this verse in Romans where it talks about, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised from the dead, you should be saved. You, know, you believe it in your heart, but then you confess it with your mouth. You know, that's why at Believer's Fellowship, we still give invitations. So people in coming forward can confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior to those who, who they're coming forward to. Th- that's really why we continue to do baptisms, because baptism is really just an, it's a public confession of your faith. It doesn't save you, but it's a testimony that you give and you're being baptized. Uh, of, of, that you, you, you're owned now by Jesus, that he's your Lord and Savior. In fact, many places in the world, if you're baptized openly and publicly in a meeting, where you'll be ostracized by your family. In some places, they'll throw you in jail. In some places, they'll behead you. Why? Because you're embracing Jesus publicly. You're, you're claiming him as your Lord and Savior. And I've seen a lot of people who kind of go up to the cross and say, well, I, I, I got that, but I don't, I don't want anybody to know what I've done. I don't, I don't want to tell anybody, and I don't want anybody to, to you know, what, what will people think about me, and what will, what will people say about me, you know. Uh, that's just a point of pride in your life. Simply put. You've got to remove the I. What I this and I this and what will they think about me? The me, me, me this and what will they say about me and what will they do? Hey, that's got to go. When you come to Jesus, I think it's the same willingness like, like, like the early apostles who realized that when they said yes to the Lord, it's going to mean their life. Ultimately. Some were beheaded. Some were crucified upside down. Some were you know, crucified right side up. Some were stoned to death. Some like John were thrown into boiling pots of oil. That didn't kill him. They finally killed him later. You know? So what, where's our willingness to own up to Jesus? Has there been a time in your life, or maybe you've done it in the privacies of your own bedroom and somewhere where you've prayed to receive Jesus in your life, but you've never gone out and stepped out into the world, into the light, and said, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Now that's, that's becoming less popular every day. Less, in fact, many churches don't do it for fear of, of this intimidation factor. People are not comfortable doing that. But I, you can't tell me you don't love it to see those old Billy Graham crusades with masses coming forward and confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. You can't tell me those who go down to Central America when we get those mass invitations and all those people coming to know Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? When people, hey, and what safer place to do it than when the, in the house of God with the people of God? But how many people at this point, they just kind of fold up their tents and they don't really, they don't confess Christ openly and publicly. And therefore they wonder why they, you know, when the Bible talks about being a witness and being the light and being the salt, they never are. And they live with this doubt, this lingering, why, why, why do I have assurance of my salvation? Because they're trying to kind of come in like the CIA, you know. Secret service, undercover agents for Jesus. Jesus said, you confess me before men. And there's a great, great story in, in the Bible, in, in the book of Revelation. And what's happening is the Apostle John is there, and, and there's this mass of people who, uh, who, who get saved in the tribulation at the point of losing their head. Right? They're beheaded for their faith in Jesus Christ. And when John's going around heaven, he's asking, well, who's that group? And, and, and they, they, they tell him, well, that group, well, that's the people that overcame the devil. I'm talking about the Antichrist and the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, it's, hey, there's kind of three C's there. One is the cross. Jesus was crucified for our sins. That's the way we're saved. Anybody who gets into heaven has got to come by the way of the cross. All right, the blood of Jesus still saves. The second C is their confession. All right? They weren't ashamed to stand for Jesus at the point of losing their lives. You say, well, I would do that. Would you? When you can't even stand at work? When you can't stand before the students at school? You know, we can't stand in our community, in our neighborhood, let people know I'm a believer? 
The third C has to do with commitment. And this is exactly, if you take this out and you pull it out and put it up next to Romans where we've been reading a while ago, it's, it's the same thing. We believe with our heart. Jesus is God's sacrifice for our sin and God, God accepted it by raising him from the dead. It showed, hey, I, this is an approved gift, an approved sacrifice. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And then with my lips, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Unashamedly. And I'm not holding my life back. It's, hey, we're owned by God, lock, stock, and barrel. Amen. Jesus said, you know, uh, take up the cross, deny yourself, and follow me. It's pretty simple, isn't it? I'll make you fishers of men. If I believe, I'm following and fishing. That's what it comes down to in our life. You know, Paul wrote the church in 2 Corinthians. He said, listen, he said, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know not you your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. What's he saying? Make sure that you know you know. Peter even said the same thing when, when he wrote the church in, 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 uh, in uh, I believe, 1 Peter, when he said to them, he said, make your calling and your election sure. No, just be sure you're saved. Make sure you're not a counterfeit. Make sure you hadn't tried to come in another way. Make sure that you based your salvation on the facts of the gospel and the word of God. But if there's anything we ought to walk out of here, this Resurrection Sunday is, is with an assurance because Jesus has been raised from the dead and I put my faith in him and I've confessed with my mouth that he's risen from the dead, believed in my heart. God's raised him from the dead and I'm a saved. I'm, I'm a believer. How about you? You have that assurance? Do you have that knowledge in your heart today? Or is that little point of pride that comes up and says, well, you know, I want to, I'm, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to keep it to myself. It, this is what the world tells us. It's a personal thing. It's, yeah, it's extremely personal, by the way. But it becomes so personal to you, you can't help but say something about it. Amen. But that, isn't that the way it really works? Like the things that we really embrace and love, we just got to talk about. All right. Sometimes it's a girl, sometimes it's a guy, sometimes it's a sport, sometimes it's an activity, sometimes it's a career. But more than anything else, what it really ought to be first and foremost is Jesus. Yeah, you wouldn't believe what God has done for me. I just, I just can't kind of talk about it. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'm saved. Do you have that assurance today? As I said a while ago, we give invitations at Believers Fellowship, so I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask you to just...